This week on Cracked Science, we tell you whether you're a genius or a moron using your DNA. Really? Can, can we do that? Can we really do that? Hey, this is Jonathan Jerry, and you're watching Cracked Science, the show from the McGill Office for Science and Society that separates sense from nonsense on the scientific stage. The topic this week is this. It's fine. <laughs> Intelligence. The less there is, the happier the folks at the Darwin Awards, which celebrate individuals who improve the gene pool by eliminating themselves from it. What do we know about the causes of intelligence significantly increased in the past year? And yet overall, this knowledge is rather thin, which makes a recent development somewhat distressing. But more on that later. First, what is intelligence? Intelligence can be defined as the ability to learn, reason, and solve problems. Problems like, where did I leave my keys again? It happens to be a very stable psychological trait and one that cannot be changed easily, though there are ways of influencing a child's environment in order to increase their intelligence. And no, I do not mean playing baby Mozart. Getting your three-month-old to listen to Eine kleine Nachtmusik will actually not increase their IQ. Ditto for omega-3 supplements. A recent review of the evidence found no effect on children when taken during pregnancy or breastfeeding, and the data on older children and on adults is inconclusive. What will work is making sure children and pregnant mothers get enough iodine, removing lead from their drinking water, and taking that baby away from you if you're at the very low end of the socioeconomic ladder and getting them adopted by a richer family, which now that I phrase it like this, sounds like the plot of a very dark Disney movie. These interventions can work because half of all variations in human intelligence are due to environmental factors. The rest is a responsibility of your genetic code. Now, knowing that 50% of overall variations in intelligence is due to genetics, it's easy to imagine that we should, by now, have a list of genes that are associated with our IQ, something that you can get done through 23andMe, for example. It may then shock you to read the following quote from a very recent article written by a well-respected team of researchers in the field of intelligence genetics. From the 1990s until 2017, no replicable associations were found. That's right, we can put an electric roadster in orbit around the Earth, but we can't find a gene for intelligence. The reason is that there is no gene for intelligence. There is no one stretch of DNA that creates a protein that plugs into a port in our brain and determines our IQ. Rather, as it turns out, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of bits and parts of our DNA that collectively explain half of all variation in our intelligence. It's a little bit like a brick wall. No one brick is the wall, but together, all of these bricks add up to contribute to the height, opacity, and solidity of the wall. And in order to have enough power to detect these bricks, we needed to study at least a quarter of a million people. And think about it. How easy is it to get a quarter of a million DNA donors to sit down and take an IQ test? The answer is not very. I tried over the weekend, and I managed to get one guy to do it, and he's been hounding me for the results ever since. The news isn't good, Chris. I'm afraid med school is out of the equation. The way in which scientists got around the problem of corralling 250,000 people to take IQ tests is to use educational attainment, meaning how many years of schooling someone got, as a proxy for intelligence, because as it turns out, the two are highly correlated. And that opened up a very rich source of data and allowed scientists to find replicable associations between educational attainment and certain bits of DNA, whether they were inside genes or not. In 2013, scientists found three of these DNA bricks in the wall of intelligence, and these results were replicable, which is good. But in total, these bricks accounted for 2% of intelligence. So, not exactly a full brick wall then. In 2016, a bigger analysis identified 74 bricks, but those accounted for 3% of intelligence. We are told that an even bigger analysis is coming to a close and that it has found over a thousand of these bricks, but that in total, they add up to 10% of our intelligence. The reason is that each one of these bricks, each one of these letter changes in the code of our DNA, contributes very, very, very little 
to our intelligence. Despite the fact that this knowledge is quite new, that these bricks individually don't mean much, and that all of these bricks put together fail to explain the vast majority of variations in our intelligence, guess what you can purchase today? That's right. After learning whether or not you have Neanderthal DNA, whether or not you like the taste of cilantro, and if you and your romantic partner really are compatible, you can now find out how intelligent you are with a DNA test. I know who's going to be first in line for this one. That's a bad idea. Uh, that's a very bad idea. At least two companies, Gene Plaza and DNA Land, allow you to find out what your intelligence may be based on your DNA. And because we have so few bricks in the wall of intelligence, DNA Land has had to admit that most people receive a neutral score, meaning that their DNA does not put them at an increased or decreased risk for being a genius. In fact, funnily enough, the geneticist who founded the company tested himself and got a below average score. But you can go to the Gene Plaza website and click on Intelligence app and upload your 23andMe file to see where you fall on the intelligence spectrum based on your DNA sequence. And they show you a preview on their site of what this will look like. And of course, they randomly chose a result that is well above average because who is going to pay four euros when reminded that they may well be below average in intelligence? Now, there is a lengthy disclaimer on the page that this test probably won't tell you much, but they are still selling it. There are a number of issues with taking these early, hot off the scientific press's findings and offering them to a public that may, for the most part, actually think that food doesn't contain DNA. As one of the researchers involved in the basic research told the New York Times, these studies have been done exclusively with people of European descent. If you're a biologist, this makes sense. Given how difficult finding these genetic bricks has been, you want to put the odds in your favor by minimizing any variable, like genetic ancestry, that might muddy the waters. But, if you'll allow my metaphor to continue, there may be a difference between white bricks and black bricks. If you try to predict height using the genes we've identified in Europeans and Africans, you'd predict all Africans are five inches shorter than Europeans, which isn't true. This is not a new problem for straight-to-consumer DNA testing. You may remember the Korean writer who took a 23andMe test and was told her risk profile could only be compared to 76 Koreans, which makes it worthless. So if you're not of direct European descent, getting your intelligence assessed in this way might give you erroneous results. There's also the worry of what parents of young children will do with this information. Yes, the information gives you probabilities and not certainties, and the predictive value is still very low, but I worry that parents will ignore these warnings. What if a parent learns their child has a significantly below average intelligence score on one of these DNA tests? Will they treat them differently? Spend less on their education? Steer them towards less demanding careers? That might be the wrong decision. Scientists looked at the predictability of this genetic IQ test by applying it to twins they'd followed since birth and comparing it to the UK-wide exam they took as teenagers, the GCSE. Some teenagers with bad genetic IQ test scores had actually done great on the GCSE. The one positive I could find is that such DNA-based testing for intelligence might uncover bright children coming from disadvantaged communities if the test is made available to them. But because these tests are still disturbingly unreliable as tools to assess overall cognitive intelligence, the simple fact is, as was pointed out by science writer Antonio Regalado, you could end up branding an Einstein as a bozo and vice versa. And DNA tests right now might just label this bozo the next Einstein. If you want to know more about the world of genetic intelligence testing, I recommend Antonio Regalado's piece for MIT Technology Review entitled DNA Tests for IQ Are Coming, But It Might Not Be Smart to Take One. He writes about exactly how all of these genetic bricks are added up to generate the final score and goes into greater depth about the possible repercussions of straight-to-consumer genetic testing when it comes to cognitive abilities. One of the things our office does is answer scientific questions, especially those that pertain to biology, chemistry, and medicine. If you have a question for us, go to mcgill.ca slash oss slash u hyphen asked, and there's a form you can use to submit your question. In the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at CrackedScience, 
and join us next time for signs that may or may not be all it's cracked up to be.